Good evening. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Welcome to Intimate Coast, Helen Tours Huntington with Erin Kimmel. This program this evening presented by the Heckscher Museum of Art is an exclusive benefit to current members and donors. Thank you for joining us tonight and for your generous and ongoing support of the museum. We couldn't do what we do without you all. Oh, I was just told you can all hear me, which is wonderful, great. I'm Caitlin Sherrod, Development Manager at the Museum, and I will be your host for this evening. Joining me shortly on screen are Heckscher Museum Curator, Carly Wurzelbacher, and our featured speaker this evening, Erin Kimmel. Erin Kimmel is a PhD candidate in Art History and Criticism at Stony Brook University. Um, at Stony Brook, she is writing a dissertation on the relationship of American post-war landscape painting to emergent technologies of vision and the speculative development of land, which sounds like quite a mouthful. Her writing has been published by the Museum of Modern Art, Art Forum, and Art in America. At the end of our presentation, Erin and Carly will be responding to some of your questions, so please feel free to type them into the Q&A box at any time. Without any further ado, I'll now hand the program over to Carly to give you all some brief information before Erin uh, dives into her presentation. So take it away, Carly. Hi, Caitlin, thank you. Hi, Erin. Um, hello to everyone who's joining us. Um, before Erin gets started, I just wanted to share some information about the Heckscher Museum's long-standing relationship to Helen Tor and her work, um, which incredibly goes back almost 100 years um, since the museum's founding. So um, Helen Tor and Arthur Dove, as I'm sure we are soon to hear, uh, lived on a sailboat um, in Huntington Harbor near the museum. And they actually visited the Heckscher Museum of Art on rainy days. So thinking about that still gives me a little thrill when I'm in the galleries, um, thinking about being in the same spaces that they were in and looking at some of the same artworks. Um, and the Heckscher Museum has also played a major role in preserving and interpreting Helen Tor's art. Um, going back to 1972, when following Helen Tor's death, the Heckscher worked with her family to preserve and catalog her life's work, including all of her paintings and drawings, um, and to present those in Helen Tor's first ever museum exhibition in 1972. Um, the museum has uh, continued to be at the forefront of uh, tour scholarship in subsequent decades. Um, and we also now own the Arthur Dove and Helen Tour Cottage, which is their historic home and studio um, in nearby Centerport, about three miles from the museum. Um, all of this <laughs> means that uh, the kind of as a result of the museum's relationship with Helen Tour um, and this shared history, we are privileged to have the largest public collection of Helen Tour's work. Um, and much of that is on view at the museum now in our exhibition celebrating our 100th anniversary, um, which you can see until January 9. So I just wanted to lay that groundwork before turning things over to Erin and we can learn more about Helen and her work. So thanks to Caitlin and Carly and the Heckscher for inviting me to talk about Helen Tor, who's an artist that I really um, adore and isn't very well known um, within the sort of sphere of American art. Um, I think within the academic context, I'm one of the first people to write about her, um, with the exception of the Heckscher Museum that's published two books on her, and like Carly says, um, has the largest uh, public collection of her work. So today I'm just going to tell you a little bit about her and her life and her work in and around Huntington, Long Island. Um, and here you can see this photo of her on the left in the 1920s in Huntington, and then a photo of her and Arthur Dove, her partner in art and life on the right um, in the 1920s as well. So we only know broad strokes about Tor's life and work before 1920 um, because of the sort of dispersal of her childhood home in 1920 and the fact that nothing was saved from before then. 
But what we do know about her is that she was born in 1886 in a Philadelphia suburb. Um, most likely it was Roxborough. Um, and we know that reproductions of works by Diego Velázquez and Edgar Degas hung in her room. Uh, she began studying art in Philadelphia in 1902, first for three years at the Drexel Institute and then for five at the Pennsylvania Academy of Arts. And throughout that time, she received um, a number of scholarships uh, to study painting. Um, so she didn't come from great wealth or anything close to that, but she did, um, she was able, she did show some, as a sort of like early talent enough to, uh, so, so much so that an early drawing teacher in um, college recognized her talent and sort of uh, helped her by giving her a, a number of scholarships. So there her teachers included the Impressionist Long Island uh, landscape painter, William Merritt Chase, and the realist painter Thomas Anschutz. And while there, Tor became close with a young brood of painters, um, including Charles DeMuth and Charles Sheeler, who would both uh, go on to hold uh, important places in the canon of American modernism. So there at the Philadelphia or Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, she also met the artist Clive Weed, um, and they married in 1913. Um, and then for the next five years, they moved back and forth between Philadelphia and New York, uh, wherever he was able to get work. And he uh, was a commercial illustrator uh, and eventually became a sort of satirical cartoonist. Tor at the time attempted to work as a commercial illustrator, um, but she had little success in that endeavor. Um, all of the uh, information we have from this sort of like pre-1920 time in Tor's life, we know from the reminiscences of her sister. And her sister wrote that um, she may have seen the Armory show in New York. Um, and that in 1918, when her mother, uh, Tor's mother went to Paris, she asked her to bring back reproductions of the French painter, Paul Cézanne. Um, so it suggests that, that Tor was um, thinking about modern art. She'd been exposed to it uh, previous to uh, meeting Dove. Uh, certainly as an art student, she would have been exposed to it. Um, but Clive Weed, her, pre her first husband, was um, much more of a sort of traditional illustrator. So in 1919, Tor and Weed moved to Westport, Connecticut, which was a small town with a bustling art community that included many members of the American avant-garde at that time. Um, and at some point, she met there, we're not sure the exact year or month, but she met the critically acclaimed but sort of downtrodden painter that you see on the right, Arthur Dove. Um, so Dove was an integral member of the Stieglitz Circle, um, having exhibited uh, work, this work, Nature Symbolized, number two, um, in the Armory Show uh, in 1914, an exhibition that had introduced American audiences to um, European abstraction and American abstraction on a large scale for the first time, and was quite scandalous, um, responded to by, you know, everyone from the sort of normal art critics to Theodore Roosevelt himself. Um, so, but, Despite sort of often being called the first sort of um, abstract American artist, which is in and of itself a sort of uh, faulty way of thinking about art in terms of setting up some kind of progression, uh, by 1919 or 1920, when the two of them met, uh, Dove had virtually stopped painting. Um, he had tried his hand at farming and failed and eventually turned back to commercial illustration, which is something he'd done in the early 20th century. Um, and both Dove and Tor were rather unhappy in their marriages and began sketching together, which is how their relationship began. And the important date is the fall of 1921. Okay, let me go to the next slide. Um, in which uh, they both abruptly left their spouses and began a new life together here in this uh, place this photograph that you see. Um, they moved onto a houseboat that was moored on the Spite and Dival Creek, um, which is uh, the, the sort of creek that's bookended by the Harlem River and the Harlem Ship Channel um, that sort of separates the Bronx from Manhattan. 
Um, and this sort of move to the Reliance Woods community, which I'll talk about in a second, was the beginning of a nearly 20 year sort of nautical existence that the two shared um, and very productive time for both of them. Um, so the houseboat was in the midst of a really interesting and cool boathouse community that I, or colony that I had never known about until um, sort of recently, um, run by uh, a man named Pop Seeley, who had a sort of uh, boathouse restaurant there. Um, that and near the Reliance Motorboat Company headquarters. So um, this area was colloquially known as Reliance Woods, um, and it attracted a sort of um, uh, motley crew of artists and houseboaters and eccentrics. Um, it was cheap. It was far, it was close to the city, but it was quite bucolic, as you can see from this photo. What you don't see in this photo is that there were also um, a lot of, and um, there's it was also a creek that was, as I said, surrounded or sort of but, uh, buttressed by the Harlem Ship Channel, um, which is a highly industrialized area. So it's you know this is like a little tiny pastoral slice in the midst of a sort of intense um, industry-driven waterway. Um, so in 1921, that same year that Dove and Tor moved here, uh, a reporter for the New York Tribune, Eleanor Booth Simmons, wrote, quote, when in this year, 1929, a group of people can form a colony that is New York and not yet of it, can beat the high cost of living, twiddle their fingers at landlords, and within 50 minutes of the theater district dwell in perfect simplicity amid surroundings that many a summer resort can't touch isn't it a miracle? Um, so uh, yeah, so they moved to this, um, this area here. Um, and this, the Reliance Woods or sort of Reliance Boat uh, Company community ended up being there for about 10 more years before it was eventually shut down by the Parks Department. Um, okay, let me go to the next slide. So in 1922, they bought a 42 foot yawl called the Mona um, from a friend of Dove's who was an actor. Um, and over the course of fixing it up together, they began a joint notebook documenting income and expenses, which eventually turned into a daily journal recording activities and correspondence and works in progress. And this is really the only record we have of Tor's personal voice. Um, and is also the way in which most of her paintings have been dated be, because Tor rarely dated her work. So um, the first mention of, uh, oh, next slide, please, sorry. <laughs> the first mention of Long Island um, comes in a letter that Arthur Dove uh, writes to Stieglitz. Um, again, Stieglitz is um, the sort of father of American modern art. He was a photographer and a, um, a gallerist, um, a, 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 and a very important promoter, um, a sort of early developer of marketing in, um, in American art, and very close with Arthur Dove. So um, Dove and Stieglitz have a lot of correspondence that's also very helpful in helping us to reconstruct this early time uh, which, that Arthur Dove and Helen Tor were living together. And there isn't that much of her writing from these early days. Um, so in 1923, uh, Dove writes to Stieglitz, um, it's now 3.45 a.m. in the midst of a terrific gale, and we are anchored in the middle of Manhasset Bay, held by a three-quarter inch line run through a shackle to a mooring. Was afraid Reds might not be able to stand the rough seas. She has been a wonder, really has done the work of a sailor. This unity of interest is marvelous, and we are so very happy. Um, so you can see that uh, uh, and this is a photograph of Manhasset Bay, which is, um, for you guys who live in the area, uh, a little bit um, west you know, of Huntington, but this was their first sort of foray into the island, Long Island Sound. Um, and they had sort of declared they were gonna go there and try and paint. So this is a view of the bay um, from the 1920s looking out at the water. Um, 
by, oh, next slide, please. So by 1924, uh, they had uh, returned back to the heart, to Spite and Dival, to the Reliance Woods, um, and then returned back to Long Island again. And uh, they'd moored by that time the boat, their boat, the Mona, in Halisite in Huntington, um, next to the powerhouse and near the dock for steamboat service that ran to Manhattan. And again, we have a sort of record of this sort of original mooring in Huntington that would become their home for 20 years um, in a letter from Arthur Dove to Alfred Stieglitz. And he writes, we had a great trip here, landed in this harbor 930 pitch dark, found an old tower against the moon and a red lighthouse that showed on the chart, mostly large estates on the shore. We are anchored near the Marshall Field Place. That is the beauty of a boat. We can pick any estate we want to live by and are, pro are probably far happier on the outside looking in. So here we have um, another photo from the 1920s of uh, the Marshall Field Estate, which is the, the um, uh, you know, great uh, Marshall's Baron who built this palatial estate uh, there as part of the development of the Gold Coast of Long Island. Um, but I think this quote is an interesting and important quote specific, I mean, for sort of both of them and uh, this, this idea that they're probably far happier on the outside looking in. Um, Helen, Arthur Dove and Helen Tor, and as you'll see throughout the rest of this talk, sort of tended to always exist on the periphery um, of, of sort of what we call normal life, like living in, you know, un, uh, sort of rather unorthodox environments um, that were never, you know, they're very rarely sort of in the center, well, never in the center of a town, um, always sort of on that sort of periphery, often um, one that's sort of what we would call today ex-urban or being developed. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So um, here's a view of Marshall Field Estate from the 1920s, just so we can sort of see what um, they might have seen as they were sailing around um, uh, and because it's fun to look at old photos. Um, okay, next slide. So like I said, they uh, moored the Mona and Halisite in Huntington, which is a very well protected part of Huntington Harbor. Um, and a nearby stream provided them with fresh water. They also had access to fuel and coal and um, abundant seafood in the harbor um, allowed them to keep food expenses low. Um, and it's here that, that they both start working um, in the sort of cramped conditions of the Mona, which was a 42 foot boat, but which you could not stand like a sort of average adult could not stand erect in the boat. Um, but it's at this moment they sort of start turning their attention to the watery shorelines and everyday life on, um, on in those sort of Long Island Sound. Um, and in doing so, the sort of tight living space of the boat meant that they worked often side by side and developed a very shared pictorial language. So the earliest surviving work of Helen Tours that we know of is um, this work entitled Geometric, which is a drawing composed of overlapping curvilinear and angular forms with acute triangular shapes that jet upward, upward and crisp edges and an area of white ground, maybe in the center or definitely in the center that maybe creates a bit of an illusion of space. Um, and there's a level of control, but also rhythm that's gonna become pretty characteristic um, of Tor's lifetime output. Um, and this book was one of the reasons we can date it uh, so easily is because it was included in Sheldon Cheney's Primer on Modern Art, an early sort of textbook like publication. Um, and in the text that accompanied the piece, Cheney wondered, quote, whether purely abstract pictures give rise to deeper aesthetic pleasure than the partly representative picture, quote, mentioning that, quote, something coming into the abstract work of certain Americans, especially Georgia O'Keeffe and Helen Tor, which is emotionally very moving. Um, so comparisons to Georgia O'Keeffe, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. 
or probably something of a double-edged sword for Tor, whose art um, was continuously uh, ignored by Alfred Stieglitz, who was sort of the man who could make your career happen um, at that moment, um, and Arthur Dove, Arthur Dove's dealer, and George O'Keefe was his lover. Um, so despite the gains that women made into the workplace and for female suffrage in the early 20th century, um, quite ironically, maybe between 1890 and 1930, the number of female art students had fallen by 10%. Um, and there was a pervasive anxiety um, among cultural critics of the day uh, who were expressing uh, um, trepidation about the over refinement and feminization of American art. Um, so as modern art comes into favor and 19th century aesthetics fall out of favor, um, those sort of older aesthetics are being recast at this moment as genteel and feminine um, in opposition to this new idea of a sort of virile and heroic and self uh, expressive masculinity um, that one sees in sort of realism or modernism. So this is connected to the rise of something like social Darwinism um, in the 1920s in which gender is understood as, um, as a fundamental characteristic of identity. Um, but it's also, sorry, New York. Um, it's also about um, the reorganization of the art world around a commercial gallery system. So um, that actually ironically had the effect of giving fewer opportunities to women. So Georgia O'Keeffe was the exception to this rule. Um, and a large part of O'Keeffe's success um, throughout the 1920s owes to Stieglitz's marketing of her paintings as sort of vibrating with an essential femininity. Um, so as we can see, uh, Tours and, and O'Keeffe's works are uh, sort of quite different um, in the, this, uh, maybe not in subject matter, but in the way they're being executed. So it's been suggested that Tor felt pressured to work in an abstract mode. Um, and the sort of influences on the sort of abstractions that she did produce throughout the 20s um, are, are sort of broad. There are all sorts of things that you could read into it. Um, and you get the idea with a lot of her works of this period that she's sort of trying things on for size. Um, and it's not until sort of a few years later that it seems that she sort of hit some kind of stride in developing her own sort of identity in painting. Um, but if we do compare these works, the one on the right by Georgia O'Keeffe, right, is, um, the sort, there's a sort of delicacy and sense of motion that's quite different from Helen Torres on the left. Um, wh whereas O'Keeffe's iris has like a sort of that sort of delicate vibrating quality, um, Torres forms tend to feel sort of inert and heavy. Um, so where Torres feel open, Torres feel, or uh, O'Keeffe's might feel open, Torres feel kind of closed off. Um, and I don't mean this at all as a criticism of the work, just to sort of get that out of the way, because I really love her work. Um, but it is a characteristic of her painting as a whole. So there's a heft to all the forms in her work um, that's really sort of unique to her. So um, O'Keeffe actually summed up uh, what happened to tour uh, the sort of collision of gender and uh, the, the commercial gallery system quite nicely many years after Tor's death, um, when she said, when Tor's work was given to Stieglitz and he wouldn't show it, I felt it was probably a mistake. The things were small and colorful in a very reserved fashion, but I thought they were very good. I think she is a person who would have flowered considerably if she had been given attention. It seems a pity uh, when you look at what she did anyway. So, um, uh, so yeah, so it's a sort of nice summation of kind of maybe this sort of trajectory of Tor's career and a little bit what happened from another artist of the time um, who was working in that same group and was sort of the only female that was allowed in there. And next slide. 
So Tor seems to be at her best, um, in my opinion, um, in a sort of series of still lifes and almost comedic landscapes that she painted over the next nine years while she lived on and off the Mona um, in Huntington. So life on a boat necessitates a constant stream of chores. And uh, while Dove painted sort of sweeping meditations on the universal forces of nature, we go to the next slide, please, Caitlin. Oh, I don't know how that got there. Okay. Um, uh, on the universe, uh, well, so actually maybe go back, yeah. So while <laughs> Dove um, painted sweeping meditations on the universal forces of nature, the ebbs and flows of the tides and the waxing and waning of the moon, and the, he sort of painted the movement of celestial bodies and raging storms um, uh, and or sort of like a steady descent of snow, um, Tor tended towards the quotidian particulars and she did so at, at a close range. So um, this might have been because she used the boat as a studio for the most part, whereas Dove um, ended up quite, quite soon after they moved to Huntington um, renting um, a greenhouse and then uh, the top of a yacht club to um, paint in. Um, but it also is just sort of difference in their personalities. Um, so in this work, Matchbox with Lemon, for example, we see that she, it, which she painted shortly after her arrival in Huntington, she renders an oyster shell, a blue matchbox, a lemon and an orange triangle with a sort of remarkable precision, and this is not the best reproduction of it. Um, she places these over disparate forms, carefully rendered in ink, and there's an austere sort of min minimal air to this. So um, Tor commented in her diary, uh, quote, the first thing I ever did that had, about the painting, the first thing I ever did that had any way a square inch of vibrating color, quote. So now next slide, sorry, Kayla. <laughs> So um, this observation of Tours about her own work and that sort of vibration of color is very important um, because there was a fierce discourse going on in American art around this time um, around this notion of place and its importance in American art. So it was descended from um, the American philosophical strain of transcendentalism and then infused with a sort of European symbolism. And essentially, it became about capturing the essence of different geographical locales. Um, and it, that became a model for making abstract or semi-abstract art in the 1920s. Um, so the author and critic D.H. Lawrence sort of sums it up uh, very well. Um, when he says the spirit of, and he's theorizing it as well, uh, along with a host of other American writers and critics, and he's saying the spirit of place is a strange thing. Our mechanical age tries to override it, but it does not succeed. In the end, the strange, sinister spirit of place, so diverse and adverse in different places, will smash our mechanical oneness to, into smithereens. So there's this pervasive idea that if you can capture the sort of insistent geographical spirit or energy of a place, um, it will have the power to sort of overcome and soothe, uh, sort of act as a salve for uh, the pervasive mechanization that's happening in the 1920s. Um, rise of cars, rise of um, any, you know, all sorts of different uh, mechanics. Um, so he goes on to say the spirit of place should not be understood as something superficial, external, or natural, that it is as something simply defining the territory of a given place. Rather, it is the very soul of the place, what differentiates it from all other places on earth, and has influenced behavior, attitudes, beliefs, and the practices of the people inhabiting it. Um, can you go to the next slide? So um, this is a, a painting by Arthur Dove that's maybe more typical of this idea of capturing the essence of a place. Um, it's in this idea, in this, um, in this model of art making, uh, 
it's an it's an artist's job to translate energy onto canvases that allows you to see and feel um, that sort of essential vibration. Um, and that that, like I said, would act as a salve against the alienation of increasing mechanization or urbanization of city life. Um, so we could view um, Dub and Tor in, uh, as one of many regional artists of the time who were turning their attention away from the city um, and imagining sort of far-flung locales such as Maine and Nova Scotia, New Mexico, as provincial places where people worked in a traditional economy um, and whether that was on land or in sea, and, and then in a culture that was sort of seemingly unfazed by modernization. Um, and it's important to note that at the same time that these authors were um, sort of uh, advocating for this sort of notion of place, the tourist industry was also advocating for a notion of place um, by a, appealing to summer visitors in search of contact with nature and escape from congestion. So, um, so this is a sort of maybe more, um, this is our Dove's work in comparison to tours often sort of held up as um, a sort of more, like I said, universal, sort of getting at that sort of maybe a vibrational energy of the sun and the water, a sort of like pure look at um, sort of nature. Um, next slide. So what are we to sort of do with Tor? Because she doesn't adhere to that really strict idea of place. And to be clear, Arthur does, doesn't either entirely but his work has really been read that way. Um, so what I'm interested in doing briefly is putting um, Tor's work in conversation with Huntington as a sort of locale. Um, and here you can see she starts painting. Uh, she loved to collect shells and feathers um, and she starts painting sort of these objects that she's collecting around her um, as she moves into the late 1920s. Can you go to the next slide? And here we see another really beautiful um, piece by her that's a little later, but um, the shell, stone, and feather with bark. And again, this the the sort of mastery of um, a sort of simple uh, still life, which is you know in a way kind of traditional. But she's um, taking all of these. Um, objects that are sort of native to uh, her landscape and then representing them in a very intimate, sort of close up particular way. Um, next slide. So Huntington wasn't necessarily, it was, it was very idyllic, but there was also a lot happening at that time. Um, so between 1920 and 1930, Huntington's population increased 84% from 13,000 to 800, or 13, essentially from 13,000 to 25,000. Um, and Huntington Village began to take shape um, with one large building project after another along uh, New York Avenue. So the arrival of the Long Island Railroad in 1867 had kicked off the transformation of Huntington's economy from primarily agriculture and shipping um, to tourism and commuting. Um, but particularly it was in the 1920s that new technologies of transportation, particularly the car, made remote areas more expensive. Um, so, you know, the sort of traditional uh, Gold Coast uh, mansions are you know, sort of happening between 1900 and 1930. Um, and so the North Shore had been sort of turned into sort of baronial and a set of baronial and manicured estates. But it's also in the 1920s that vacation homes and tourist cabins and motels start popping up across the island um, that are specifically um, uh, geared towards a middle class demand for vacation homes. Um, so in particular, uh, while Tor and Dove lived on the Mona, um, 
middle class summer bungalow communities developed along the shores of Centerport Harbor, Huntington Bay, and Huntington Harbor. Um, at the same time, because the harbor was well protected, it did remain um, not, not a massive hub, but it still had a, um, an important role to play in shipping. So um, the uh, so Dove and Tor were living um, sort of in the midst of this harbor. And so what you see here is a photo that they took a sort of bustling harbor. So what you see uh, here on the left is a photograph that's undated, but that's in the Helen Tor um, and Dove archives. And then you see um, it's for Amityville, Long Island on the right, but an advertisement for lots and homes. Um, so it was also in addition to sort of summer rentals, there was a lot of like early suburbanization happening at that time as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, at the same time, like I said, there's still a lot of industry there. So in actually, um, when it starts to get cold in November of 1924, um, Dove and Tor moved the boat to the power plant station um, at the foot of Main Street in Northport. And I haven't figured out exactly why they did that yet. Um, but as you'll see there, and you see this photo from 1925 of this new electrical plant, they're not existing in this like completely idyllic um, sort of industry-less uh, natural landscape, which was what, um, what the sort of proponents of, a lot of the proponents of uh, that sort of like essential vibrational uh, American modernism were um, sort of bringing about. So during this time, for from throughout the 1920s and their time in Huntington, um, they lived a very modest lifestyle and Dove supported them as much as he could with magazine illustration. But um, by the time the depression hit, the magazine work had dried up. Um, and, and then sort of during the depression, the two of them were living um, very modestly uh, and trying their hand at all sorts of different work in order to try and make a sort of modest living. Um, it's important to note that obviously uh, Helen Tor didn't ever have any commercial success in her lifetime and, and Arthur Dove had a, a small amount but very little. It was really after his death that the world started celebrating his art. Um, so Dove tried his hand as a commercial pilot and a maker of frames. He also painted awnings and tore hand tinted slides and created collaged greeting cards um, and also produced commercial designs, but um, the commercial designs were not super successful. Um, additionally, she sewed thrift store clothing for both of them, a practice that had carried over from before the depression because they never really had very much money. Could you go to the next slide? So this question of what the sort of landscape around Tor was like in the late 1920s um, is one that I've become really interested in um, because like I said, it doesn't totally hew to that obsession with a sort of any notion of a purity of place um, that someone like D.H. Lawrence would, was espousing. Um, instead, by the end of the 1920s, Tor's paintings are retaining a greater fidelity to the subjects that inspired them. And the subjects that inspired them is the Huntington area. Um, and often they're unremarkable scenes devoid of the sort of nature worship one would uh, associate with this time. So in this piece, uh, windows and a door, for example, we see a slanted door book ended by two windows. Um, and in those windows, it's unclear whether those are reflections, right? Or that's actual, this sort of structural part of the window. I think it looks like she's painted the reflections in those two windows. Um, it's also unclear whether, it's sort of unclear from looking at this immediately, what exactly it is. Um, is, is it a door and windows that belong to a ship? That's sort of like the immediate association I think someone has when they look at this. Um, or, but then you see the sort of strange framing and the, the sort of walls coming out from the right side of the painting and wonder if it's perhaps um, on a dock. Um, and 
then the sort of lighting is very strange, um, right? You have, I mean, you it seems the sort of light parts um, within that dark brown frame seem to be quite illuminated, but there's no consistent use of shadow. So it's this very sort of like cartoony, otherworldy. I feel like it feels a little bit noir, even though it's um, sort of early for noir. Uh, but it has this sort of noir character. Um, and then in the center of that door, right, we have a red star, which um, likely denotes the headquarters of the Red Star Line, a ferry, captain, a ferry company whose captains um, both Tor and Dove really um, respected for the way they maneuvered in the harbor. Do you go to the next? So as I started looking through the archives, um, I realized that there are some pretty clear clues to exactly what she's painting. So in the undated photographs section, um, you can see here, and I don't, I don't believe this is Arthur Dove, but um, on the left, uh, you see this man who's standing, I'm pretty sure on the deck of the Mona in the winter. Um, and if you sort of zoom all the way back, you see that red star. And um, in, the, in the blow up of the picture, you can see that there's, um, that there's, uh, that, that looks quite similar, right? Those two sort of strange windows um, and, uh, and then that red star. I mean, I don't know, I could be crazy, but it seems quite, quite clear, right? That, um, that she is painting the headquarters of the Red Star Line. And that would make sense if we think about where the Mona is positioned in this photograph. Um, uh, because um, her studio, again, was always the boat, um, never you know, the exterior building, the way that Dove um, had access to. So um, can you go to the next? So in the late 1920s, uh, Tor seems to sort of hit a stride of painting these sort of vernacular, um, almost melancholy, like cartoony and comedic scenes of life in the Huntington Harbor. Um, and they're very matter of fact, I think, and yet there's like a playful quality to them that um, I'm not, sure exactly where it comes from, still sort of working that out, but there's something funny that happens in her paintings, um, sort of in the late 20s of around Huntington. Um, so here we see um, from August 1929 that Tor recorded that she made a drawing of a barge full of houses and she called them, quote, really quite funny. Um, so she made an original drawing uh, and then she, the next day began painting. And I'm sorry for this reproduction, the Metropolitan Museum doesn't have a great image of it on their, their website. But the original sketch, which was in black and white, lacks this sort of ominous sky, um, making the painting much more somber than the sketch. Um, but the gathering clouds on the horizon suggest a rising storm, the kind of bad weather the artist was really intimately familiar with after eight years of living on a boat. Um, and the dark palette, right, the sort of muddy palette gives it uh, also an ominous move, um, or mood. So this um, is one of uh, a number of paintings that Tor actually did exhibit, um, but in 1927 um, at an exhibition curated by Georgia O'Keeffe at Stieglitz's Opportunity Gallery. Um, and the show seemed to give her confidence um, in 1927 and sort of propelled her forward into a very productive few years. So um, the next couple of paintings we'll see is from this like really productive spurt that she has. Can you go to the next slide? Um, I'm almost done. So um, here we see one of the Heckscher's pieces. Um, sorry, I just lost my place. Um, another one of these sort of um, comedic landscape cartoony sketches um, that she made, or paintings that she made in July of 1930 when a mist tide caused a day sail for Northport to be canceled. Um, 
and her and Dove anchored in Huntington Harbor and Tor made a sketch of two oyster steaks and a month later she used a slide projector to enlarge it. Um, and I think it's fitting, right, that we're talking about the sort of funny cartoony aspect of it, the ways in which she doesn't necessarily fit into a lot of what's going on at that time. Um, but she's a very self-aware person. And so she records in her diary, um, quote, I started painting two oyster flags, got sky and a part of water, said to myself, oh Lord, save this from being trite. So many skies and waters have been done up till now. Um, quote. So um, she's aware, um, you know, she has, uh, this is sort of characteristic of her as well, right? She um, suffered from both depression and a chronic GI illness um, that made it, often made it hard for her to paint. Um, but what we see in this, as we see in many, is this, this sort of like mesmerizing and rhythmic motion of waves, a sort of all over quality to the canvas where one section doesn't seem to be weighted more heavily really than others. Um, next slide, please. Um, so galvanized by Tor's productivity, Dove did eventually convince Alfred Stieglitz to exhibit Tor's work in a joint exhibition at the American Place in 1933. And this was the second and final exhibition that Tor would exhibit work in during her lifetime. So. This painting, Melodrama, as well as what we just looked at, Houses on a Barge, were both featured in a back room of the exhibition. Um, and this piece, Melodrama, is Tor's largest oil, and it was um, inspired by a storm approaching over Northport Harbor that she initially captured in charcoal and pencil. So again, we have got uh, a dramatic subject um, sort of dispersed evenly over the entire canvas. Um, we have a sort of generalized trees echoing a sort of generalized curving bank of clouds above. And then we have the sort of white boats that are popping out against that landscape and sort of, you know, floating in the water quite calmly. So um, the calm of the painting, but it's perhaps pretends some of the major shifts um, that were about to come in the two artists' lives. Um, so during preparations for the exhibition, Dove's mother died, and it was discovered that her estate was heavily encumbered by taxes. Um, Tor and Dove were themselves in quite bad financial straits, and uh, by 1933, they decided to move to Geneva, New York, to sort out the estate and save some money. Um, they meant to stay for one year, but they ended up staying there quite unhappily for five. Um, so, after the show in 1933, Stieglitz had declared in a letter to Tor that there was no quote search um, in her work, although some of it was very good as pictures. Um, and she suggested, and he suggested that she look where elsewhere for representation. Um, so she was um, she was quite gutted by that, and um, it and that sort of happened at the same time, around the same time that um, they. Dove and Tor sold the Mona and um, pushed off for Geneva. Um, they meant to stay for a year, but they stayed there quite unhappily for five. Next slide, please. Um, and eventually, uh, eventually they moved back. But um, the sort of quote from um, the review of the exhibition that year in 1933, this is the only review of Tor's work that we really have is um, an American place is also showing a group of paintings by Helen Tor, who in private life is Mrs. Dove, a procedure similar to that of the Strand exhibition when one room was given over to paintings by Mrs. Strand. Mrs. Dove alternates between abstract and naturalistic effects, and as often as not pays her husband the sincere compliment of following in his footsteps. So um, not much on Helen Tor in the only uh, real review that she ever received. Um, she eventually returned to Long Island. Next slide, please. Uh, or she continued to paint up until she left. And these are some of um, some really beautiful works that she did um, during that time. But next slide. 
Um, so eventually after five years in Geneva, she returned to Long Island and um, her and Dove bought an old post office overlooking the water in Centerport. Um, but a few weeks after their rather triumphant return, they were really pleased to be back on Long Island. Dove um, fell sick and ended up remaining so for the rest of his life. Tor, um, by that time, 1938, had stopped painting entirely to support his work and health. Um, but she ended up living in this cottage that the Heckscher Museum owns um, until her death. Um, and it's uh, because of the Heckscher that people like me know um, anything about the work. Um, so th there's still a lot to work out around, um, around Tor and her legacy. Um, and uh, I look forward to sort of seeing what happens with it. Thanks so much, Erin. Um, so I would like to take this opportunity to um, have Carly come back and join us on screen as well, and we'll answer a few questions if that sounds good. Okay. Um, so first question. Um, so I think you answered this one a little bit, Erin, but just to elaborate, um, one of our viewers was wondering about the relationship between Helen Tor and Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, did they really know each other very well? And like, what, what was their relationship like? So that's a good question. Um, they, I think that they had a, a warm, and I wouldn't say overly warm, but maybe more like a cordial and distant um, friendship. I think it was sort of a mutual respect, um, but maybe nothing, um, nothing particularly close. I mean, it's been many different things have been, I mean, some people have suggested that O'Keefe was very um, territorial, territorial around her role in that circle as the only woman and didn't want to let anyone else in. Um, you know, other scholars have sort of taken that apart a little bit more, but uh, it, it wasn't a particularly close relationship, no matter how you um, sort of spin it. Uh, but the, the quote from O'Keefe uh, later in life is telling of the sort of conditions of the time. Um, the fact that she, you know, is sort of looking back and saying like, he probably made a big mistake and she did like the work. So um, our next question, um, how does Helen Tor's work fit into your larger dissertation project? Helen Tor is the first chapter of my dissertation. So I'm trying to, um, I'm really in the midst of unpacking it. I'm really excited. The Huntington Historical Society, I would have loved to regale you with photos of historical Huntington, but unfortunately the Huntington Historical Society has not reopened since the pandemic. So Unfortunately, we don't have uh, access to um, archival images of Huntington right now. I love though, Erin, the photos you did have and in the red store line, it's incredible to see that ice build up. Yeah. Um, first of all, and then it's wonderful to see the photo in connection with the painting. Um, and then I also was really interested to learn about the houseboat community um, that predated their time on Long Island. Um, and then thinking about too, that really this all started in Westport, Connecticut, which is on the Long Island Sound. So it's incredible how they're really just orbiting this body of water um, throughout their lives. Absolutely. Yeah, they're really, I mean, and they were really living a hard scrabble life on the water. It was not, it was not, um, sexy at all <laughs> it was it was tough they were living there in the winter for up until i think 1927 um but yes they they really got to know the waters of the long island sound and communities there too so two questions sort of jumping off those points. So the first question, um, so I know you were talking about um, delving into the archives and really uh, learning more about Helen Tor. Um, so I assume that there's still not a lot of scholarship about Helen Tor and she's still basically overshadowed by her husband. Is that correct? Yes. 
Yes, that she just doesn't have a very large output of work, um, which again, that O'Keefe quote ends up really summing it. You know, she really did um, suffer from a sort of debilitating, um, uh, I don't know the word, what would you say, Carla? Like she was, um, I mean, she was very insecure about her work. Um, and so that, that that's why I sort of focused on that period from the like late 20s to the early 30s where she just really pushed it out. And it, it feels really different from a lot of the sort of tentative works she was doing in the early 20s. Um, but yeah, she's definitely overshadowed by Dove. Um, and I think that sort of like my job is to try to figure out right now, like why she's important and what she actually um, is contributing to the discourse. Um, and I think there, that I, I think that it is an intimately connected to the local history of Huntington. Right. And I think it's interesting, Erin, you say that she has this, she shows her work, which spurs her to, to create more work. And I think, um, I'm not suggesting you're doing this, but to be like frustrated with Helen, like, why didn't you just keep working in obscurity, you know? Right. Right. Um, if you have no outlet for your art, if you're receiving zero positive feedback, um, if you're not making a living at all, mm -hmm. um, why keep producing? I, I think there's no, um, you know, we might like to think of a romantic figure like Van Gogh or someone who kind of sticks with it despite the odds, but um, really why would one do that? <laughs> and I think it's not, um, yeah, I think it's not to Helen Tor's detriment that she um, turned her attentions elsewhere. I think that's not surprising. Absolutely. And she really did, every year she, um, when Dove started showing again, she would stop working for three months in preparation to help him um, organize his yearly exhibition. So she also gave um, a lot of her time to her husband who she loved immensely and who supported her immensely. And then there's, I mean, he was, um, you see it in the archives and his constant letters to Secrets. Like he is trying very hard. He never gives up to support, like he, um, to support her work. Um, so, and it's just unfortunate that, um, you know, he gets sick as soon as they come back to Long Island. And then that really just, it's sort of curtains for her, um, her time. Uh, she already didn't have very much time to paint, uh, taking care of him and, and doing sort of the more things that were associated with being a woman in the 1920s, um, but it just completely eliminated any extra time she had. Right, and I think he's supportive of her, but it's interesting, it's not totally reciprocal. He's right. not stopping work for three months to help right. Helen. Like, right. yes, writing some letters and saying right. nice things, but right. he's not... Um, you know, they're not really meeting in the middle. Absolutely. <laughs> I would I would say that's absolutely right. <laughs> Our next question is, um, did Helen Tor have any contact with the Surrealists? Um, and then there's sort of a part B to this. Um, what, what do you think motivated Helen Tor to paint? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know if she had any... Um, I assume she was aware of the Surrealist, but I haven't come across anything about the Surrealists um, and her work. Um, and that's an interesting thing to think about actually, um, because maybe you could interpret it as some of it as a little surreal, or strange, that sort of like noir -y aspect I was talking about. Um, I don't know what, and I don't know what inspired her to paint. I think. I mean, I, she clearly loved it. And I think she, it sounds like she had great success when she was young. Um, I mean, not great success, but for a woman in 1903 to be getting scholarships to go to the Philadelphia um, Pennsylvania Academy of Arts was like, you know, not a small feat. So my guess is that she really loved it. Um, uh, you know, but that, yeah, that lack of feedback and that lack of time um, you know, but probably lack of interlocutors besides Dove um, made it so that she, you know, it 
I think it became really, I think there's some painters, you know, there's some painters who love to paint and there are some painters who have a really hard time with it. It's like an affliction. Um, and you can talk to contemporary painters about it. It's like some of them love to go to the studio and some of them feel complete dread, but just have to go and are incredible painters. So, and same with writers. So, um, I don't know, some sort of like deranged artistic impulse that all people who make things like that have. I mean, I say that in like a celebratory way. Um, okay, so I think our last question this evening is um, a little bit for both of you. Um, so Erin, you mentioned the Duck Tour Cottage that the museum owns now. Um, have you visited? What are your impressions of the cottage? And then the part B of that question is for Carly. What is it open to the public? What is the museum planning on doing with the cottage in the future? I did get to visit the cottage about six months ago, maybe, or eight months ago. And I thought it was really um, lovely uh, and also very sort of sobering to see, um, you know, the cottage was like them sort of their look, like their moment of luxury in life. Um, and it's quite a simple structure and, you know, so and one room and um, but it has really beautiful proportions and I can imagine why um, it, you know, it feels like living on a boat on the water and that's something that was so important to them. So um, I thought it was fantastic and I can, and so exciting that it's there and it exists and the Heckscher has it. So I don't, I can, I can go to the Carly now. Um, yes. So we are very fortunate to have purchased um, Arthur Dub and Helen Tours Centerport home, the home that they spent the last years of their life in. Um, and at this point, um, we have able, been able to preserve and stabilize the historic structure. It is on the National Register of Historic Places. It's part of a group of artist studios, um, which the Georgia O'Keeffe Home and Studio also belong to, since she's someone who's come up a lot today. Um, it's Called, it's part of the National Trust. It's called Historic Artist Homes and Studios. Um, so the building is um, stable and preserved, and we're looking forward to um, continuing always to take scholars and interested people to the cottage. Uh, so you're welcome to email me for, and I'll, I'll take you over, um, anyone who's watching. Um, but in terms of being open more fully to the public, it's something that we are working toward. And I think interestingly, um, the experience of the pandemic and the museum's um, experimentation with new technology, these different ways that we found to bring people into spaces virtually, I think all of this is exciting for how we can interpret and share the Dove Tour Cottage, which is a very small, um, intimately scaled building on a small site, um, really li almost quite literally directly on the water. Um, so it's a fantastic opportunity and something I look forward to working on with Erin and other um, scholars and community members. Um, it's really a treasure. Thank you both. Um, thank you so much, Erin, for speaking about uh, Helen Tor and giving us this presentation. It was really wonderful, and I think everyone learned a lot this evening. Um, thank, you. thank you to our viewers for participating. And as a reminder, if you'd like to view works of art by Helen Tor, as Carly mentioned, several are on display alongside works by Arthur Dove as part of the museum's current exhibition. Um, that exhibition is entitled The Heckscher Museum Celebrates 100, Tracing History, Inspiring the Future, and is on view until January 9th of next year. You can visit heckscher.org for more information and to schedule your visit and to learn more about Helen Tor and the cottage, as Carly mentioned. Stay well, have a wonderful evening, and thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.